We're going to get into God's Word. We want to welcome the Pound Church joining us and those on the website also to our message this morning. We're going to go in the Old Testament again today as we were last time. We're going to go to Proverbs chapter 21. But really the text, the message I want to talk to you about today is out of Exodus. So we're going to be in Exodus 3 and Exodus 12. And my goal today is to help you again to speak God's blessing into your life and cancel every curse that has stolen his blessing from your life. How many of you want to live in the blessing of God? I do. I raise both hands to that. Shows two armpits, but you know, that's the way it goes. So I want the blessing of God in my life. And to begin with this morning, I want you just to read out loud with me this passage from Proverbs chapter 21, verse number 23. You got it? Read it with me. He who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. And let's read it out of the New Living Translation as well. It says, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you will stay out of trouble. <laughs> wow, that is good language for us today. Just keep your mouth shut. Turn to your great neighbor right now and say, when are you ever going to learn to keep your mouth shut? <laughs> well, I'm here to help you do that and keep you out of trouble. So... If you weren't here for the last message, you may be asking, well, what kind of calamity are we talking about? What kind, of, what kind of trouble or curse are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the same kind of trouble, calamity, and curse that the Israelites put themselves in when God called them to go into the promised land, the land of milk and honey. God said to them, it's time for you guys to turn a new page in your life. It's time for you to head north for my blessing. It's time for you to fight some new battles take some new territory because we all need to grow in our faith, right? It's time for you to do something new for me and my kingdom. Time for you to take some, get some new victory, some new real estate, move into the land I promised you. And they responded that with words that rejected God's plan for their life, words that negated the blessing God had for them and opened up kind of a curse in their life. They responded with words that empowered their enemy and diminished God's power in their life, words that destroyed their destiny and canceled God's plan for their life, and words that released a curse that blocked God's blessing in their life. Instead of the land of milk and honey, they died doing circles in the wilderness. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't usually wake up in the morning and say, I hope I die doing circles in a wilderness. Anybody, is that your goal in life? Ultimately, I want to die doing circles in a wilderness. Listen, how do you say, Pastor, I want to live in the land of milk and honey. Yeah. You know, what that represented for them was a land that produces, a land of great agricultural production. And you know what? If the farmers are, are prospering, everybody's prospering. So it would, the blessing would fall down to everybody. So a land of milk and honey, everybody's prospering in that land. Go to Exodus chapter 12 with me. As you're going there, I've got a little picture of a ship that I want to show you. And I think it represents, I, I like this picture. It represents so many things. It's a picture of a big ship that's a tipping over, one of these big cargo ships. And all the cargo is tipping to the side and the ship's about to go under. And for me, I think it was just a picture of what's going to happen to these Israelites when they said no to God, when they said, not your plan, our plan, my plan, not your plan, God. That was the moment their ship started to sink. And you know what? For you and I, in our lives too, it's a picture, an analogy of our life whenever we question God, we question His promises, we question the direction he's giving to our life, and we say, no, God, it's my way, not your way. We're that same sinking ship about to go underneath the water. So go to Exodus chapter 12, and let's talk about the Lord shows us how we can gain his blessing in our life and live under the protection and blessing of God. Exodus 12, verse number 13. Lord, Jesus, as we look into your word today, we just... We just say, Holy Spirit, have your way in us. Holy Spirit, anoint the word and the messenger and let us hear from you. Let us hear the word of the Lord today and speak into our hearts, God, because we want to live in the land of milk and honey. 
We don't want to live. We don't want to die doing circles in a wilderness. So raise our lives up today, God, that we can, that we can live in that land of blessing and free ourselves from every curse, every bondage our mouths have gotten us into. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. All right, Exodus 12, 13 says, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. How I many like the sound of that promise? No destructive plague will touch you. Well, I'm liking that. I don't want a plague to touch me or my house or my family or my marriage. Do you? Your business, whatever it might be. No, we want the blessing of God. And you know what? There's so many people in this world today who say, no, I want to make my own choices. I want to decide my own morality. I'll, I'll choose my own values. I don't need some book or some God telling me how to live. And you know, what happens when you do that is you bring yourself underneath a curse. And you, you cancel the blessing that God would have for your life when you choose not to go into the land he has invited you to go into, just like the Israelites here. So before this promise was made, the Israelites were slaves, right, for over 400 years in Egypt. And their hands were in shackles, and they were forced under brutal uh, labor, slavery really, they were forced to build bricks. You know, they didn't go to the lumber yard. They didn't go to Joe and say, I need this. Here's my list of materials I need. No, they had to build their own materials from the mud up and then go in and build these cities for the Pharaoh, build big cities under this force. The Bible says it was brutal labor, slavery that, that they were brought onto, onto. Their hands and feet were in shackles. And they did something, and we're going to read about here in this passage of Scripture. They did something, I believe, that released those shackles from their hands, released them from out of the slavery that they were forced into, opened a new door of destiny for their future and did something that would give them a hope, give them a future, and give them a new life, a blessing for them and their children. What did they do? Well, that's what we're going to find out in Exodus chapter 3. Go with me to verse number 7. And the Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard their crying out because of their slave drivers and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. What did they do to break the curse and release the blessing? Well, I want to talk about five things that they did to break the curse. Number one is they sustained their identity with God. Look at this passage. The Lord tells Moses, that he has seen the misery of his people. Notice he calls them his people or my people. They're my people. Uh, there's always a temptation when life gets hard, when trials come, when unexpected things happen to us, when losses come, when pain comes, when hurt comes into our lives, grief comes into our lives. There's always the temptation to blame God or to accuse God and say, God, where were you? Uh, you, you know, you didn't hear my cry. You didn't see me. You didn't care. You don't care about what I'm going through. And you seem distant and far away from me. And after a long week of making mud bricks, and you can imagine a long week of making mud bricks for 40 years under the hot sun, that they could come to the place where they would say, you know, God, you don't care about us if you even exist. They could begin to question because... Look at the position these people were in. Listen, they had no retirement plan. They had no social security system to help them in old age after they retire. You know, after I retire from my slavery, then I can live on my IRA, right? They had no IRA. They had no savings account. They had no sick leave. They had no holiday plan. Uh, they had no social security. There was no end in sight for them. The only hope for them to get out of slavery was to die. And, you know, after 40 years of that, I'm sure the temptation would be to come to the place where you say, God doesn't even exist. 
And if he does exist, he surely doesn't care about me. So why should I want to serve him and seek him? But what we're seeing in this passage is God says, I've seen the misery of my people because you know what? These people, this generation, these people for 400 years maintained their relationship with God. They're still his people. They still belong to the Lord. Uh, they held on to God. They maintained that the Lord is our God. He will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He has a plan for our future. They believed and held on to their faith that said, God has a plan for us. Even after 400 years, eventually he's going to make a way from us. He's going to deliver us. Our God is faithful. He will bring us out of slavery one day. And their hope was in the Lord because, you know, they would say, yes, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. We're not Egyptians. We are the Lord's people, and he's one day going to deliver us. That's how the Lord could still call them his people. The biblical illustrator says it indicates three things. Number one, it indicates ownership. It indicates endearment, and it indicates astonishment. So, number one, that they belong to him. Number two, that he loves them. And number three, he will deliver them and bless them eventually. And so their hope was maintained in the Lord. Our God is an awesome God. They worship the Lord at the end of the day. The end of the day is slavery. They would still seek him and still declare him to be the Lord their God. Too many people accept Christ claim that they belong to Jesus and they've invited Jesus into their lives. But then when they have to start to pay a price for that relationship, that new relationship with God, begin turning away. You know, when some of the old friends desert them and don't want anything to do with them and they're missing that. And maybe some unexpected things happen in their life or some trials come into their life because of it. Popularity falls away. Maybe doubt comes into their minds. Very normal process when people come to Christ. They go through a time of trial. And that is going to indicate what's really in their heart. And too many people, when the unexpected things happen, turn back and turn away, just like these people. And say, well, I'm going to head back to Egypt because that looks better now than it did before. So I'm going to go back to my old way of life. And they leave that relationship with the Lord. Jesus warned about this. I think it's kind of a warning in Luke chapter 8 when he talked about the four kinds of seed. And the seed represents the hearts of people when they hear the gospel and how they respond to the gospel when it's planted into their hearts. So he said, number one, there's the seed that falls on the hard path. And it represents the, the people who hear the word of God. They hear the word, but but birds come along and the seed doesn't get placed underneath the ground, but the seed's laying on top of the ground. The birds see it and they come in. And he said the, the birds represent Satan. And Satan comes into their life to steal that seed away so that they hear the word, but they never grab onto the word because it's removed from them. They never become believers and they lose out on hearing about the Lord. Number two, some fell in the rocks, Jesus said. And it sprouts in amongst the rocks. And it represents people who hear and believe for a while. But then when the sun gets hot, because they don't have good soil, their, their roots don't get down into the fertile soil, the sun gets hot, testing, the testing time comes. And Jesus said, and I quote, they fall away. They hear the word. They believe in the Lord. They start to grow in the Lord. But then they fall away. The seed dies, and they lose out on their salvation. The other seed, number three, falls among the thorns, and it sprouts, and they also believe. But then Jesus said, three things get in the path. Life's worries, riches, and pleasures. Jesus said, choke the growth of that new plant out and destroy the nourishment to the plant, and they also die from lack of nourishment. They too fall away. So the, for the first three, 75% of the four, they're hearing the word, they're getting it, but they're losing out. They're giving it away. They're not getting the nourishment. They're not growing. They're turning away from the Lord and going back to Egypt, going back to their old lifestyle. He said, only the seed that falls on good ground, and he called good ground a noble and good heart that retains it, that hears the word and retains the word. What's he talking about? He's talking about people who hear the word, hear the gospel, 
build their lives upon the gospel, allow the gospel to nourish their hearts every day. They're nourishing their lives. They're, they're, they're renewing their minds. They're reading the word of God. The word of God is filling their hearts and, and uh, filling their minds. And they retain the word and that word begins to fill their mouths, and soon they're speaking the word. So it's not only in their mind, but it's flowing through their life as well. And the word of God is beginning to be, bring about growth and spiritual nourishment in their life. And they experience the blessing of God because they then produce a crop up to a hundredfold, Jesus said. So the only ones who are going to prosper, the only ones who are going to maintain a spiritual walk with the Lord are those that take the Word of God, allow the Word of God to fill their hearts, fill their minds. They're speaking the Word of God with their own mouths now, and God's Word brings about a prospering, and they begin to bear fruit as they touch other lives. So these people are people that have decided that they're going to retain the Word of God in their hearts, and they hold on to the Word of God in their hearts, and they speak it with their mouth, and only these people truly belong to the Lord because they've done what they needed to do. They filled their hearts with the Word of God and the Word of God has taken over their mind. They're speaking the Word of God and we could say they truly belong to the Lord. Jesus has true ownership of their heart and they're going to stand strong and they're going to bear much fruit. See, becoming the 25 percenter, becoming the one who, 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 who lives for God who's identified as a believer, who sustains their identity with God, isn't something that just happens magically. It happens because you take the word and you put it to work in your life and you begin to speak the word. You do the work that, that separates you and sets you apart as a new believer that's sustaining and nourishing your heart and your mind with the word of God. So that now as you speak the word of God, it brings about a blessing in your life. And that's what the Israelites were doing. They were speaking the word of God. You have to sustain your own identity with Christ. Number two, they cried out to God. The second thing they did to break the curse of slavery is they cried out to God. Look at verse number seven. They prayed and interceded to break the curse in their life. And it's a picture of the power of prayer. I think sometimes we think of prayer as just this thing we have to do in church or whenever we get in trouble. Then we pray. But no, these people were crying out to God and the Lord heard their cry. I believe they learned the power of prayer from their father. The Israelites learned about the power of prayer from Father Abraham. And Abraham was a man of prayer. In fact, the Bible calls him the friend of God. If you want to pray powerful prayers, I think there's six things you have to do. Six things I think Abraham did. Write them down. Number one, what Abraham did is he maintained a friendship with God. He was called the friend of God. He made time for God. How do you keep friends? You make time with them, for them in your life. Number two, he communicated with God constantly. Number three, he trusted God completely. Number four, he took God with him wherever he went. Number five, he sought his forgiveness quickly. Whenever we offend God, we need to quickly seek God's forgiveness in our life. And number six, he lifted up his name. He told others about him unapologetically. So when Abraham obeyed God's plan, God spoke to Abraham and said, 70 years of age, right? You're leaving home. Where am I going? Well, I'm not going to tell you where you're going. You're going to walk by faith. He left his city, Ur of the Chaldees, and he went out and left home, set out for an unknown destination. And wherever Abraham stopped, he piled up some rocks and he built an altar. He brought his family around him and they did a sacrifice on the altar. They worshiped the Lord and praised the Lord on that altar. And then they spent some time in prayer before the Lord. You say, how do you know that? Well, Genesis 12, 7 says that he built an altar there to the Lord. As soon as he got away from home, he set out. He built an altar to the Lord. Verse number 8, he, he, he went east and he piled up some stones and he called on the name of the Lord. Verse number 8, as he went east, there he built an altar. And wherever Abraham went, he built an altar. He became the author of the family altar movement. 
So he took his family, and wherever they went, they, when they would stop, they'd build up this altar, and they'd spend time with the Lord. And that way he taught his family about prayer and the power of prayer. And I'm sure there were generations, there were people that came after him, uh, walked in the same path that he walked in, and they would come to a place, here's a pile of rocks. And the kids would say, well, what's this all about? And they would say, well, this is Abraham's altar. Wherever Abraham went, he would spend time with God, and he would pray, and he was a man of powerful prayer. And when he prayed, God listened, and God heard his prayer, and God did amazing things. Well, what kind of things did God do? Well, for instance, God promised him, even when he was beyond the age of having children, that he was going to have a son. His wife was too old to have children, and God promised them that he would have a son. And God answered that prayer, and he had a son, and God did a miraculous thing in their life. When they were too old to have children, God gave them a child. You can imagine, as the clock is ticking, you know, years and more years are going by, God, where's the promise? That the Bible says... Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. He trusted God even when it didn't look like the promise could be fulfilled because that's the man of prayer that he was. He believed God would hear and answer prayer and keep his promises. That's what the Israelites were doing for over 400 years. They saw the powerful prayers of Abraham. They learned how to pray powerful prayers from Abraham. And now they themselves were crying out to God and God was going to answer their prayer. Abraham was so close to God that God revealed to Abraham the plan he had of destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. Can you imagine being so close to God that God comes along and says to you, I've got a plan to do this thing in the city. And God speaks to you and tells you the plan he has. That's how close to God Abraham was. And, and I think God did it for a reason when God shared with him the plan he had to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, remember what Abraham's response was? He didn't say, yeah, God, fry them all. Let them all burn. Let them be cursed. What he did was he began to pray and intercede. And he said to the Lord, well, Lord, what if there's, what if there's 50 righteous people in the city? Would you destroy the city for 50 people? And the Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people, I'll spare the whole place for their sake. And Abraham said, well, what if there's five less? What if there's 45 righteous people in this city? Would you spare this city for 45? And he interceded for that city. No, if there's 45, I won't destroy the city. Well, what if there's 40? And what if there's 30? And he, he continues to pray and intercede. What if there's only 20? What if there's only 10? Would you destroy? No, if there's 10, I won't destroy the city. Ian e. Bounds was a famous pastor, pray, uh, man of prayer. And he said it, it, it was probably because Abraham was overly optimistic about how many righteous people were in the city that he didn't continue to intercede for them when he got to the number 10. He must have thought there were at least 10 righteous. There weren't. And because there were less than 10, he, if he would have gone another step, Ian Bound says, he probably would have spared the whole city and delivered the whole city. But what I want you to see is that's the power of prayer. It's kind of like changing God's mind. Well, God is involved in using him as a mediator, but God wants to use you that way in prayer. He wants to intercede through you and think about the people that you know around you who aren't living for God, who don't know the Lord. The Lord wants to use you to mediate and be an interceder and become a powerful man or woman of prayer. Do you believe it? I believe that's what God is teaching us and telling us right here. And you know what? The Israelites learned how to pray from Abraham. And they were about to break a 430-year curse. In fact, if you look at chapter 12, verse number 40... It says they were going to break this curse of 430 years to the day. So what that tells you is this whole thing was under the hand and plan of God all along. You say, Pastor, can 430 years of slavery be the plan and will of God? 430 years to the day tells me the Lord was in control of their deliverance. 
And you know what? It was going to happen because of the power of prayer. And the blessing was going to be released. Look at verse number 36. It says that they plundered Egypt. Well, what had happened was Moses went to his people and he says, okay, God's going to deliver us. He's answering your cry. He's answering your prayer. And here's what you're going to do. I want you to go to the Egyptians and I want you to ask the Egyptians for going away gifts. That's my interpretation of it. Ask the Egyptians for going away gifts. And the Bible says that the Egyptians gave them silver, gave them gold, gave them clothing, and gave them bread dough. You know what? God not only answered their prayer, he not only broke their shackles from slavery because of their prayer, but you know what? He filled their bags with silver and with gold and with clothing and with food. They left Egypt rich. Let's just call that the blessing of God. And so their prayer broke the curse of 430 years exactly of slavery, lifted them from out of the curse, and brought on them prosperity, financial blessing, and enablement for the future God had for them to live. Even food. You say, well, you know, Pastor, I, it seems like my finances have just been struggling and I struggle with my finances and never can seem to get anywhere, never seem to be building anything, nothing positive is ever happening in my life. Well, maybe there's a lack of family altars in your life too. I'm not saying that lack of prayer is always the reason we have financial struggles, but it looks to me like it can be. A lack of family altars, a lack of time in prayer, a lack of asking God for deliverance of your financial curse and asking God to pour out a blessing on your life. Maybe there's a lack of family altars, a lack of waiting on God, a lack of hearing from God, a lack of doing what he says, a, a lack of following his financial plan for your life that he's given us in his word. You know, I think what this teaches me is why not pray, pray and ask God for financial blessing? Why not go to the Lord and say, God, break this. You know, I feel like I'm under a financial curse here. Break this curse in my life. Free me from this because I want to live in your blessing. I, I, you know, I don't have to be rich. I just want to live in, under your blessing and feel like the Lord is blessing me and enabling me and providing for me and, and helping Cry out and ask God to release a new blessing on your life and just see what the Lord will do. Number three, they persevered in prayer. Look at uh, verse number seven, Exodus 3, 7. They cried out because of their slave masters. What that tells me is that not even these brutal slave masters could keep these people from praying. Not even the brutal whip could divide them or separate them from the Lord. Nothing would, would cause them to quit from praying and, exceed, and interceding with the Lord. Whips couldn't drive them from God. They continued to pray. No matter how much they abused them, they continued to pray and to seek the Lord. How many thousands of people died in that 430-year period of time? Never seeing the blessing. Never seeing the release from the curse. Never seeing the slavery broken. How many people died over 430 years? Praying and crying out and believing and saying, God, you will deliver us one day. And they persevered and believed that one day their families would be released, would be free, and God would bless them again as a nation. I don't know how many thousands. Never gave up. Ask yourself this morning, what keeps me from spending time with God? Ask your neighbor this morning, what keeps you from spending time with God? Because we have all kinds of excuses. I mean, there's, our excuses are unlimited. Because I've heard all kinds of them. Well, I have to get up early to go to work. I have to make lunch for my family. I have to do Black Friday shopping. That's a once a year excuse. I have to eat more turkey. I have to go to bed early. Uh, I have to get my kids ready to school. We all make the same mistake when it comes to prayer. And here's the mistake we made. We all try to make time for God. 
And that's a mistake. Because if you're trying to make time for God, just know this morning that the enemy's going to make sure you don't have any time for God. And things are going to come up, and things are going to get in the way, and babies are going to cry, and kids are going to have needs, and life is going to go on, and you're never going to find time. Don't try to make time for God. The only way that it's going to work if you start to plan intentionally what time you will spend with God. That means every day you plan a certain time, you're going to spend that time with God because you believe in the power of prayer, you believe in the power of persevering in prayer, and nothing is going to keep you from praying and seeking the Lord. That's the only way you're going to make time and spend time and see the curse broken in your life through prayer and live in the blessing God wants to pour out on your life because of your prayer is if you intentionally plan times to spend with the Lord. Number four, the fourth thing they did to break the curse was they accepted God's plan for their life. So look at verse number eight. He says, so I have come down to rescue them. God's telling Moses his plan. Why? Why should he tell Moses his plan? Well, he's telling Moses his plan so that Moses will become part of the plan. Moses will say, well, that's an awesome plan. What can I do to help? And then Moses will go to the people and he'll say, this is God's plan to break you out of your slavery, to break this curse in your life. This is God's plan. This is what God is going to do. He's te he tells the people so that the people will say, well, what do we have to do? You know, to be part of this plan to break this curse in our life. If you want to walk in blessing and free yourself from every curse in life, join God in his plan to rescue others. Find an opportunity for evangelism because evangelism is the heart of God, is the heart of the Father. To rescue people from spiritual slavery and set them free and give them new life is the heart of God. To free people from their sin from their addictions, from their, you know, their ungodly lifestyles is the heart of God. Read Luke 15. All of these parables Jesus gives about the, the shepherd going out to save the one sheep out of the 99. Finding the lost coin, the prodigal son. It's all teaching us about the heart of God. If you want to break curses in your life and you want to live under the blessing of God, the key is to join God in his plan to rescue other people from their spiritual slavery. If you'll join him in reaching out, he will bring a blessing on your life. Every time you hear a plan for an outreach, you need to jump in with both feet. Why? Because God blesses people who join him in saving the world. Some of you wonder why things aren't going that great for you. Things aren't going that great for your family. Maybe there's a family member who just won't, won't yield their heart to God. Maybe your life is a struggle. Your marriage is hurting. You feel you're under some kind of curse. What should I do? Pastor, what should I do? Every time you hear a plan to reach out to unsaved people, jump in with both feet and become part of it. Put an evangelism program together for your life. You know what? Start your own life group because life groups are primarily, yeah, they're about fellowship, but they're about reaching out. Find somebody who doesn't come to church and invite them into your home to be part of your life group. And eventually they probably will start coming to church. It's the simplest plan I know of, of evangelism, to help people find Jesus. Invite him into your home to do a Bible study. You know, when you hear about an outreach like the turkey dinner, because that's what the turkey dinner is all about. It's not just about feeding people it's about telling people about the love of Jesus by something we're doing with our hands and feet and filling their stomachs. That's what it's really about. It's about an outreach. When you hear about a, a 1031 fall party, the Halloween party we did was an outreach. You hear about VBS. You hear about the Christmas musical. You hear about the Christmas tea, which incidentally is coming up very, very soon now. It's an outreach to invite other people who don't know Jesus to come in and hear the gospel. When you hear about the angel tree that we're doing, it's an opportunity to, to purchase some gifts, to give to kids, to touch those families for Jesus. It's an outreach. When you hear about those things, jump in with both feet because you're saying to the Lord, Lord, I want to be part of your plan to break people out of slavery and to come into your kingdom. 
And if you'll join God in his plan of bringing people to salvation, he will break the curses in your life and he will pour out new blessing on your life and family. Number five, they lived under the blood. We're going to go back to that original scripture that we talked about in Exodus 12, 13. So God sends six, six plagues, six curses to break them out of their slavery, right? Six curses that harden Pharaoh's heart. The seven is the worst. The firstborn in every child is going to die. Horrible curse, horrible plague on the Egyptian people. And God's promise is everyone who's under the blood will live. Everyone who's under the blood will be protected. Everyone who's under the blood will be out from under the curse, and they will live. Look at Exodus 12, 13. The Lord says, I will pass over you. And that's the Hebrew word, pisach. And another way to translate pisach means to stand and protect. So God is saying, I will stand and protect you. If, you, if you'll come under my blood... Put the blood over the doorpost, right? And you're going to be in that home that's covered by the blood. If you'll do that, God says, I will stand and protect you. What a great promise. It means that we're living under God's plan for deliverance. It means we're living under his sacrifice. It means we're living under the blood of the lamb. For them, it was a lamb they would sacrifice. For us, it's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'm living under the blood of the Lamb God has provided for me, who's Jesus. I'm living under Christ. I'm trusting in Him, His sacrifice, His forgiveness, His daily cleansing in my life. Living free from sin, free from guilt, free from regret, free from condemnation, free from the fear of judgment. As Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the blessing of God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want to live under the blessing. How about you? I don't want to be under that curse of death anymore. I want to be under the blood. So those that are under the blood, the Lord promises this blessing. I will stand and protect you. The curse of death is lifted from my life. Hallelujah. The, our identity changes. We become sons and daughters of God. The only way to really live forever with Christ is to come under the blood of Jesus. This morning, Lord, we just thank you and we give you praise that you've made a way as you made a way for these people. You've made a way for us, Lord, to live under the blood. And I thank you that the blood provides for us today, the blood of Jesus provides for us today salvation, an eternal relationship with God, our creator, provides for us life eternal with you and a new life that we can live out for you. This morning, I would ask everyone, if you say, Pastor, I'm ready to sustain my identity with Jesus, I want you to stand to your feet. You say, I'm ready to cry out an intentional prayer to the Lord, I want you to stand to your feet. You say, I'm ready to, to persevere in prayer, I want you to stand to your feet. You say, I accept God's plan and join Him in rescuing others. I want to do that, I want you to stand to your feet. As you say, I want to live under the blood. You say, I'm ready to live under the blood of Jesus Christ and commit my whole life to him. I want the curse broken in my life, the curse of sin, regret, condemnation, guilt. I want that curse of sin broken in my life. I'm coming under the blood this morning of Jesus Christ, and I want to walk in the blessing God has for me. I want slavery to be broken from off of my life. And I want to walk under the blood of Jesus Christ. That's you this morning. I want you just to stand to your feet with me. So worship team leads us in our closing song today. Listen, I want to invite you just to pray a prayer with me today. Jesus, break sin's curse from off of my life. Destroy death. Destroy sin. Destroy all of its consequences. And pour out the blessing of life. Pour out the blessing of your love. Break the curse. Pour out the blessing of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.